How does the hair look? I can, if it's sticking up or anything, no, it I can looks good. fix it. Well, flying as the, well, the first woman pilot, as well as the first woman commander, was a lot of responsibility, and it was important for me to do my job the best I can, not make a mistake, make sure the mission was completed. And I never really thought about the <clears throat> historical aspect of it, but I thought more about the fact that other women would be following me, and I wanted to set a good example for uh, you know, women who are interested in being astronauts someday or maybe, you know, being pilots or joining the military. So I really saw it uh, from that perspective, I think. And <clears throat> people often ask, how, how did it feel? I never really thought about how anything felt. I just thought about the mission. What are the mission objectives? Is what we're doing, you know, whether it's my position or <clears throat> the position of one of my crew members or the crew as a whole, and working with mission control and you know, really the whole team where we, what we were doing was that fulfilling the mission. And I think as far as how did it feel, that really comes about after the mission's over and you can look back and reflect. And I think it's, it's really a sense of accomplishment in a sense that, you know, whichever mission I flew, that we were able to fulfill the objectives. And the last thing I'll say on that is, is the commander, you really realize that it's a team, it's a team effort. And it's, I think that, point is driven home for all astronauts that we go into space we have a successful mission we come back safely and you thank the team and it really comes from your heart so returning to earth i think was primarily a major effect on my after my first mission um, i flew four times my second third and fourth mission i was a little more uh able to kind of predict what the issues would be. I never had a clumsy feeling like dropping something, thinking it was going to float, but I did have a, a very unusual sensation that I hadn't heard about before. <clears throat> My first day back on Earth when I woke up, uh, you know, I'm sleeping and I, I woke up that morning and I had lost all the feeling in my arms and my legs, basically my skin. I woke up and I couldn't feel any weight around me. I couldn't feel the bed. I couldn't feel, uh, I mean, it felt like I was floating again. And at first it surprised me. And then I started laughing, thinking, well, this is comical. And then I was wondering why no one had told me about this. And as I is, I think it took about five, maybe seven minutes for my feeling to start coming back. <clears throat> and then I got up and started like getting the blood flowing again. So I talked to the flight surgeons about it, and they said that sometimes if you have not been um, using your nerve endings, you know, that's an effect that you can have. Not every person has that happen, but I readapted very quickly back to being on Earth. It's a funny thing that happened after my second flight, but to a much smaller extent, and then it did not happen after my third and fourth flights. And I think you'll find that astronauts have different, different things happen to them, and I, I think the only other thing I'd mention on that <clears throat> would be after my last flight, I, I walked around a lot the day I had returned home. So the, the day after that, which was my second day back on Earth, my feet hurt so bad I could not walk. And I had to, I, I think I remember staying home that day and, and working from home as much as I could, giving my feet time. And I think what happened was the bones in my feet had shifted. And when I came back and started walking on my feet, the bones went back to their gravity position and that caused some pain in the, uh, you know, in my foot overall. So these are things I, I think that we just need to be aware of. And there's countermeasures to keep that from happening again for an astronaut going on their, uh, well, <laughs> their first flight, as well as especially returning from uh, subsequent flights. If you can anticipate these problems happening, you can do things to prevent them from happening. So I often dream of being back in space and I'll have these strange dreams of being on the space shuttle. Things don't look like they did in reality. You know how dreams can be kind of uh, mixed in with other things in your life. So I will occasionally have dreams of being back in the space shuttle and I'll add to that, I'll have dreams of flying again, uh, whether it was back when I was in the Air Force or flying the T-38 at NASA, and I also have dreams of flying on the space station. <laughs> so 
So you add it all up and, it, and it's, I, I think it's something very normal. We, we have dreams about things that have happened to us in our lives and it's nothing that alarms me. I, I try to remember those dreams because I think that, um, I think it's just kind of interesting that our brain acts the way it does and tries to come back and remind you of things you've previously done. I'm from Elmira, New York, which happens to also be the location of the National Soaring Museum, where there's a glider port at the, the location is called Harris Hill, which is right adjacent to Elmira, New York. Actually, it's in Elmira, New York, and it's a glider port. And inside the museum, I, uh, I donated something for a display, and it's a shirt from one of my early missions. It might have been my first or second flight. And in the display, they have, um, you know, the shirt, which actually flown in space, and several other uh, things uh, from my past, and I want to say magazine articles and newspaper articles, and and this, it's, I, I think, uh, historical, so I think it's important that we have things like that, and for a period of time, there was also a summer camp at that museum, which uh, was the Eileen Collins summer camp, and the kids could see the things that the uh, gliders uh, were, you know, how gliders were um, built, how they fly, um, the kids got a glider ride, and they actually got to spend the night in that museum where my display was. So I think it's really good to have things like that to try to uh, not only remind us as adults, but also inspire the kiddos that maybe want to do something like that themselves someday. And I grew up in the area. We found uh, on one of the orbiters in, it was approximately 2004, that the rudder speed brake actuator had a wiring problem. And the way this problem would have manifested itself had it not been fixed is if uh, upon landing, this is just one of the possibilities, on landing, if there was a strong crosswind and the commander who was controlling the shuttle at the time, landing the shuttle, and then you, you use the rudder pedals and the nose wheel steering as you roll out to stay on the runway. If there had been a strong crosswind, the commander would have used a large correction on those rudder pedals. There would have been a possibility of, because of the miswiring, of the opposite rudder being activated. For example, you might step on the right rudder to steer to the right and you would steer left instead. We're not sure exactly how that would have manifested itself because we didn't actually test that. It would be an uh, interesting thing to test, but it, the correction was made. And fortunately, uh, I, I believe this, I, I don't know if it was on the shuttle Atlantis or Discovery, but fortunately that was corrected. It was inspected and corrected on all the shuttles. And how does something like that happen? It, it's, it's why we need to uh, test everything. We need to make sure the paperwork is accurate. And you know, I, I mentioned the testing, uh, sometimes it's expensive to run tests, but it, the more tests that you run up to a point, the safer your uh, spacecraft is going to be. So. I've always been a big proponent of test, 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 but I think that particular problem that you mentioned goes way back to the early days of the shuttle. So of the four space shuttles that were flying during the period of time when I was an astronaut, um, I, I flew three of them. I think they all flew very similar. I do not remember any differences as far as handling qualities or that would be on entry and landing. And I don't remember any differences between how it flew in orbit as far as uh, doing the maneuverings in orbit, you know, the little jets fire to uh, correct your attitude or translate to a different location. Don't remember any differences, but I will say <clears throat> the big difference in from a pilot's point of view has more to do with the weight and center of gravity. So I landed the space shuttle twice. The first time, it was the shuttle Columbia. We had no payload, we were fairly lightweight. <clears throat> I think the shuttle was very responsive and easy to land. 
My second landing, we were very heavy. We had this uh, logistics module in the back. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the weight was, but it might have been like 30,000 pounds difference, so something on that order. And it, the uh, shuttle itself uh, had more of a delay in the controls, and it just felt heavier. Um, heavier shuttle, uh, maybe more sluggish controls in the pitch axis. Not really the the yaw or the uh, roll axis, but more in the pitch axis. A little bit of a delay. But from one orbiter to another, no real difference. And I didn't have a favorite orbiter either. I think they were all um, they were all my favorite. I love space exploration, and the reason I, you know, I've had roadblocks along the way, um, even back to when I was a pilot in the Air Force, for example, back prior to 1973, women were not allowed to fly any aircraft in the United States that could potentially uh, go into combat, and these were combat-rated aircraft, a fighter, a bomber, reconnaissance, close air support, women were not allowed to fly those. I knew that that was going to change someday. The women just had to prove themselves as time went along. I think the uh, country's leadership, the Air Force leadership, realized that the women can do a really great job flying any airplane. And the uh, combat exclusion law was changed in 1993. I never had a chance to fly a fighter operationally, but I did have a chance to fly as an instructor in the T-38, and I flew the cargo aircraft, the C-141. Both of those aircraft very well prepared me for the uh, astronaut program. So looking back, I have no complaints. Um, but looking back, I'm really glad that I was part of that generation of women that was able to uh, do our jobs and show that women can fly, which later allowed the combat exclusion law to be lifted. So I'm not sure what else to say about that. There were roadblocks along the way that had nothing to do with being a woman, but had to do with dealing with the bureaucratic system and the laws and the rules that were out there. I wrote a lot about this in my book. And there had been throughout my life reasons, oh, you can't do that because of this rule, and the rule made no sense, or maybe it didn't apply to what we were doing. And so those are frustrations I think that we all deal with. And I think we need to think logically, how can we change the rules or the bureaucracy or policies to make it uh, apply more to common sense and to let us, uh, I would say, have a better chance of operationally succeeding in our mission without having too many rules. Now, I am a person who follows the rules, and it's important that we have that for safety, but we just have to think about you know, why we have them and if they apply to every situation. So work-family balance is very important for women as well as men, but I think women get asked this question a lot more than men because, you know, women traditionally are the moms that nurture at home, you know, raise the kids. It's just kind of a traditional thing that we do. But I had help from my husband. So you can't do it all alone. You can't be everything. I kept telling myself I can't be everything for everybody. Um, people would often ask me, can you have it all? And I would often say, well, you can't have it all. You can't have everything. That's just not realistic. But you can have a, a lot of things if you love what you're doing and you work hard and you set priorities. So being a mom, I had help from my husband. We also, uh, we had a nanny when my kids were very young and she was great. It, she uh, really not only uh, took care of our kids, but she read books to them, did art. Um, she was very good disciplinarian. And we were very lucky to have her. Also, the other women astronauts that were mothers would help. The other male astronauts that were fathers would help. So we helped each other. You don't always want to take advantage of other people's you know, goodwill and kindness. But when, when we were in trouble, for example, a uh, last minute simulator gets on the schedule and I don't have a babysitter, it's nice to know that you have people that can you know, take your kids while you have to run into work for something. So those were difficult times. I, my kids survived it. Um, they're both uh, doing really good. Uh, I survived it, and I, and I look back and I say, you know, I had the two best jobs in the world. I was a parent, 
and I was an astronaut. So um, it was hard, but I'm not complaining. I'm, uh, I look back, I remember the good times. So who were my heroes and role models? Well, by far my parents. Um, I dedicated my book to my parents. They struggled in life for a variety of reasons, you know, financially and, you know, family issues. And so my mom and dad really struggled, but they had such a positive attitude. And I, I think I learned from them how to, um, I, I think, deal with problems in life and not fall apart, not run away from problems. But when you have a problem, see it as a challenge and try to uh, get help to find ways to solve the variety of problems that you cross in your life. And I think what I learned from that helped me in my job as an Air Force pilot as well as an astronaut. So my parents by far, and outside of my family, I would say the uh, Gemini astronauts were all my heroes. That was when I was first really aware of the uh, space, pro the human space flight program. Uh, I don't remember uh, Mercury as much. I think I was too small for that. But I do remember Gemini, and they these guys were like exactly what I wanted to be. In my, I wanted to be just like them. They were, they were test pilots. They were military pilots. They were engineers, and of course, then the Apollo astronauts came about. But I think as a young child, the Gemini program is what initially really inspired me. And I'll also add to that the women Air Force service pilots that flew during World War II within the United States, they ferried aircraft around. And they were, they were very good pilots. They were never in the military, but they, uh, I wanna say they, there were enough of them and the program was visible enough that uh, many books were written about them. So when I was young in the 1970s, I learned about the, they were, they were called the WASP, Women Air Force Serv Service Pilots. I learned about them. I read about Jackie Cochran, Nancy Love, who started the, the program, and they sort of became my heroes because I wanted to be a pilot, and knowing that there were women pilots that had flown in the past helped me realize that, that it was a goal that I could reach for myself. And I should also mention, I didn't know about the Mercury 13 women until I was already an astronaut, but they were the, the women that went through the medical testing for the Mercury program. And I, I always like to say something about them because they were really a super amazing group of women that could have been astronauts, but it just didn't work out for them. Well, a moment of accomplishment. Well, by far, I think becoming a mother is, you know, I've, I've had two children and I think that being a, uh, being a mom is, I've never been a dad because, because I'm not a guy, but I think the same thing applies to the dads. I think having children and raising children, all the hard times that you have and the struggles that you have are really worth it. And I, I think that that's part of our human nature. And I really enjoyed uh, raising my kids. And now that they're older, they are really in a position to see what their mom has done. And although neither one of them will uh, most likely apply to be astronauts someday. I mean, they could if they wanted to. Um, I think that it, it, they really uh, enjoy uh, the human spaceflight program from where they are right now. And looking back at the history of the space shuttle program, it's something really special to them. And, you know, as far as, uh, you know, I think back to when I went through basic training, the second part of the question is, learning about the history of the Air Force, what to me was very, very motivational. And I worked very hard on that, and uh, uh, I did well in that part of the program. And it's something that still inspires me today is aviation history.